Hey, GovCon and Giants family, your host here, Eric Coffey. I just want to say before we get started, we are taking advantage of the membership sites here on YouTube. If you have not already joined, click on the join button now to find out how to go from just a bystander to becoming a GovCon insider. Today's guest, Raj Sharma. Raj is the co-founder of GovShop Public Spin Forum. He's going to share with us all about his story and his journey from working at a large consulting firm to founding his own consulting firm, Senseo, and then now GovShop Public Spin Forum, where you can claim your free profile there, your supplier profile. They are aggregating all of the world's information on suppliers. They are sharing that with the Governors Association, and a whole host of agencies out there. So definitely, you want to take a look at this episode, listen in, pay attention, take notes. It's a great one. Thank you so much. I'll see you on the other side. Raj Sharma. I'm the CEO and founder of Public Spend Forum. Hey, Raj. Welcome today. Thanks for having me, Eric. No, not a problem. So we actually had the pleasure of meeting a few weeks back, and so we talked, and I know a little bit about your backstory. Um, and I, I remember some of the things that you said that fascinated me. Could you share with the audience, um, how did you get into the world of government contracting and kind of where did this all begin? (laughs) Sure, I'll try to keep it short (laughs) because I don't want to bore everybody. But really, um, you know, just just a quick overview is, um, I had done work with fortune companies and consulting uh, and um, I moved back from Pittsburgh I was at a dot-com there after grad school, and I moved back to D.C. because my family's here. Anyways, being in D.C., uh, I went to a consulting firm, Booz Allen, Mm -hmm. and uh, I got, you know, of course, I ended up working on some government work. I was also doing some commercial work. Um, And, you know, I had heard all these things about, like, how boring government work might be, et cetera, et cetera. Now, honestly, I found it really fascinating. The thing that I found most fascinating about it was, that, you know, these very giant organizations and we're trying to almost like move the Titanic and drive change. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge in its own. And Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by those kinds of challenges of like, how do you change behaviors? How do you drive organizational change in very complex organizations? Right. Right. So to me, it was, it was like, wow, okay, how do you make this happen? How do you actually deliver real tangible results in an environment like that? So that's what kind of really, um, you know, uh, got me into government. And then a couple of years later, really quick fast forward, and I'll, uh, is um, I learned a bit about procurement also. Uh, and and uh, I was doing a lot of operational excellence and, and, and procurement type work. And uh, I really had an idea. I always thought I was going to start something. But I felt like you know, the way I wanted to, some of the pain points that I was seeing government agencies experience, I really felt like we needed to take a real fresh approach to the pain people were failing. And I felt like I needed to do something on my own to really create that kind of approach. And then the second motivation, besides addressing kind of the problem set uh, that government was facing in a fresher way, I also, my other motivation was building a new type of firm that really reimagined how you make people thrive. Mm. So I wanted to build a place that was exceptional from a standpoint of, you know, an exceptional place to work. Mm. Uh, and so those are the kind of the two goals I set out with. Now you, you worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been, I know it's been a long time ago. I, <laughs> <laughs> that was almost, uh, let's say 18 years ago. Yeah, since. like 18 years ago. Yeah. Um, and then you went out and you start your own consulting practice. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Yes. Now, okay, first of all, what made you leave Booz Allen? I mean, I'm sure it was a nice paying job. Oh, before we even get there, <laughs> what's your background? Yeah, so, you know, mostly business. I, okay. uh, I, I was born in India, uh-huh. and, uh, you know, I, uh, I actually lived there with my grandparents for a while. Okay. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot, but, I, you know, there was like my – my um, uncles had a little stationery store. I remember right after school every day, I'd be helping. I'd be this this weird kid who didn't go mm-hmm. out and play with the other kids, but I was always at the shop, uh-huh. right? And helping out all the time. Okay. And uh, same thing, eighth grade, when I finally moved back here and to live with my parents. Right. I, my mom had a little mom and pop store. Okay. And um, 
uh, in DC. And I used to go there right after school to help her. Wow. And, uh, you know, right after, like, I got out of school, I walked to the metro, I went uh -huh. there to help her, and we came home at night. And okay. so I always kind of had this, I think, tendency to really kind of do something where I, I like the hands-on work. So that's where I always knew I was going to start something. So mm -hmm. at Booz, it just happened that, again, I've worked with some amazing people. I have a lot of friends from there, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from everyone there. Um, but I always knew I was going to start something. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had these ideas of, you know, again, the pain points and a different way to deliver value. And then the second thing, like I said, was uh, related to how do you manage people? How do you really help each person realize their true potential? And that was something that really motivated me. And I said, you know, I can't do this in a very giant organization. Not anything wrong with booze. It's right. just hard to right, do. So I wanted to create that environment. Okay. So now let's just walk us through it. You, you leave booze and then what do you do first? <laughs> so <laughs> the, know, what's the, the, the name the of the, funny, the next organization is what? Yeah, how do you say it? Fun, Sen 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 Okay, Sensio. Okay. Um, yeah, so Sensio, uh, you know, is a management consulting firm. Um, so our focus was organizational and, and uh, performance improvement, right? That's the kind of work I was doing at Booz as well. Okay. Um, uh, I'll tell you, I actually accepted a job out of Booz. I was thinking mm -hmm. about starting something, but I had accepted another job. Okay. And I had my computer. Sunday came. I was supposed to fly out on Monday to orientation to Atlanta. And I called. I just had this feeling like if I don't do this right now, I don't know when I'm going to do it, right? I was 30, um, so I was 32 years old. Yeah. And so I just, um, you know, I called up the person that hired me. I said, look, I got to do something different. I got I to gotta do this because uh, I got to start this thing that, you know, I've been wanting to. So I had no business plan, no contracts. I had barely $50,000 in the bank. Wow. But, you know, I just went based <laughs> on, I said, you know, what's the biggest risk I'm taking? I thought to myself, right, practically, mm -hmm. before I went and told my parents who yelled at me, you know, <laughs> but like starting, they're like, what are you doing? You don't, you, do you have any idea? I, you know, the, 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 to me, what I thought about was, I have an idea of the problem and what I want to do. I don't have a business plan. I don't have a contract. I don't have any work. I have about 50K, right? What's the worst thing that could happen? Right. I did my budget. I said I can go sustain myself for about six months. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's say I get no work, nothing. And then, you know, I have to look for another job. One, I had supreme confidence in myself. I could go find another job really easily. That's, mm -hmm. Two, my equation was even if I spent $50,000 in, in the foregone income, what I would learn in those six months of even trying through the gritty part of trying to build a business and all the learnings, I had. I, at least I felt that I would learn so much that progress, even through failures of not even being able to build, I thought I could take those lessons and then apply them in another job and that would propel my career further. So mm -hmm. that's, I, I, I felt like there was really, I was just investing in myself and that's all I thought about it. No, that's a, that's an actual great answer. Uh, did you, at the time, I know that you have two kids now, um, did you, was you married at the time? Were you single? How was, no, I was, yes. you know, so that was part of what into, went into the equation of That's what, I need to start this. I, I had just started dating, who's now my wife. Right. <laughs> and I was, I was thinking the same thing. I said, I can make this decision. We've only been dating about five months. I can make this decision on my own right now. But, you know, fast forward a year, if we're married or more serious, then, you know, it's a different equation, right? So that was one of the other things I thought about is, uh, I said, you know, it's, it's a less risky, right? If you have kids, et cetera, obviously there's a lot more responsibility that you have to think of. Sure. So, so that also went into that equation. Okay. Okay. So now um, you start, I, I, you said you took a job, but we're going to, we'll skip the job part. When you decide to start the actual organization, uh, what was your first hire? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. He's, he's one of my best friends. He's like a brother to me. Um, a lot of people know him in the community. Um, he, um, you know, I, I had already started May 13th, 2003. Yes. I said, this is my official day. I'm going to sit at my desk in my right. house. Right. And, and that's my first official day. But I also called him up and, and, and said, Hey, I started this thing. Please come join me and be a co-founder. And, 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 uh, I don't really have a business plan. I don't really have, uh, you know, customers, but just come join me quit your six-figure job 
and uh, I, I promise we'll make it work. <laughs> and I, I convinced him to quit his job. And, oh my goodness! And 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 I think there's a there's a story behind it that's also kind of one of the stories that told at Sensio. What I'm really proud of, uh -huh. you know, when I met him, you know, to talk about it, you know, he kind of, you know, he thought maybe I'll have some sort of a plan, right, that I'll be going over with him. And he definitely understood like what problems I wanted to tackle in terms of on behalf of customers, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. But what I, our first conversation was not at all about that. Our first conversation was I had written down on a piece of paper what the core values of the firm should be. Nice. And that was the whole conversation because I wanted to make sure we were aligned on values. To me, that was the most important thing. And I've always felt about any business, yes, you know, you can have a strategy and a problem set you're solving, but the core foundation of everything that makes you stronger, even, you know, if you think about it as a human being, right, as a person, it's your values, right? You make a lot of decisions, especially during like when you're facing kind of some tough decision. You rely on your value system knowingly or unknowingly, right? Mm -hmm. And same thing with an organization, right? I felt those values are the things that, you know, I want the organization to stand for something. And what we do business-wise, et cetera, it's almost inconsequential to the belief that it needs to stand for something that's bigger than us. And mm -hmm. that was the goal. And that's what we discussed. And I knew he would gravitate to that because we had always talked about some stuff like that. Right. So that's that's that was our first discussion. Was, so what, what were some of those he, values? He made a decision and he quit his job and his parents yelled at him too. And so <laughs> we both got yelled at by our parents and and here we were. <laughs> and I'm sure your parents, I'm sure they're very happy with you now, right? The decision. Yes, yes. Uh, that's I, always I, the I, case, right? It's uh, you know, you're in a borderline of insanity and genius. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, they, 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 of course, like any parents, right? They, they, they want you to do, do your best. And, yeah. and, and uh, so, you know, once we made that decision, they were extremely supportive and helped us in any way they could. So. No, I agree. I, I, I was in a similar situation. I remember um, when I, when my business took a decline, I took a job for a couple months and my parents said, Oh, you should just stay at this job. It's a nice job. And yeah. you got benefits. And I yeah. said, Mom, I, I can't. Like no, but it's it, it, they're they're working with your schedule and they're giving me flexibility and I and I said it's that's not me. It's yeah, just, no, right. It's it's something I'm sure you had that burning oh, desire to yeah, go out, right? No, I said it's, I don't me. think you get. I think it's hard to explain to and someone who hasn't started something or doesn't have the desire to. Right. Right. No, it's, I agree. Right. No, yeah. totally, totally, and and. You, I mean, I know for me at least, uh, I work way harder than for myself than I would for someone else. Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> so I do. That. Uh, it's it's never ending. <laughs> so tell us, uh, can you, there are any of those values that you can remember that you could tell us, share with us? Yeah, so a couple um, that you know I, I I go to, and because we talked about them all at that time, right? It's it's I, that to me that was again very important. That's what we started with, so it's something we talked about all the time. You know, I didn't want it to be some you know uh, piece of paper that hung up on a right. wall and people walked right. by. Right. That honestly, we never did that, right? I didn't care about that because I think those are just. Um, but what the two values that I would point to one was results driven. Um, and I, why that was important to me was because, you know, I grew up with very meager kind of, um, you know, setting. Right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have a whole lot. And, and as, as kids in India and, and our family was okay, right? And, but, you know, I also saw a lot of poverty and a lot of, you know, kids like five years old washing dishes outside, right? They didn't have a place to stay. They'd sleep on the streets, and so we didn't have a whole lot, but there were others who didn't have anything at all, right? And so to me, you know, why results driven relates to that is I felt very strongly that whenever you ask anybody or you like any, any money you get, I think it was instilled in me since from uh, for, as a child that you have to really earn it. And I wanted to feel like really proud that we have done every single thing we can to earn every penny that we got mm -hmm. from anyone. And that results driven has become like, if you go back and look at Sensio, it's like so core to the DNA of the firm because it was mm -hmm. so instilled. People over deliver all the time. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm very proud of that. 
And I'll tell you one quick story related to results driven is I remember three, three years in or something, we had a client at USDA. Um, he, we had a contract with him. I did not feel like the client really knew what was like what to do. They were paying us. I went back. I won't say the last name, but his first name was David. He was an SCS. I went to his office. I said, David, I don't think you guys are ready for, you know, what you hired us for. And I feel like we're wasting money. We're wasting your money. We're wasting taxpayer money. I had the contract with me. I said, I'd like us to rip this contract and cancel it. And we did. And I said, I'd rather you deobligate the money, take it and put it elsewhere to better use, because I do not personally feel this lives up to the value system that we believe in, that I believe in, and I know that you believe in. And I'd rather you find a different place for this money than pay us with it. Wow. And so that was one of the examples. There's other example where I actually went to a client and, and, and turned away money. So maybe not the smartest business decisions, but I do think they were smart business decisions because I, I am, I think, more of a spiritual person. I believe things come back to you. I don't think about tit for tat. And I just believe in doing the right thing. And I think, to me, that felt like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really care if it came back or not at the end of the day. No, it was more about doing the right thing. Right. And you could sleep at night. Yeah, that's how strongly I feel about it, that I don't think I can sleep if I know that we at least are uh, doing everything possible Mm -hmm. to to earn everything. And then the second value, I would just say, is win-win. and, and that was very, that also came from a real experience. And win-win was about that any relationship we get into, whether it's, you know, with our clients, with our staff, with our community, with our mm-hmm. vendors, whoever, it always needs to be win-win, right? And it's because I had seen some examples of very short-sighted thinking where people, you know, one on, on one hand, say one thing and turn around the next minute and basically are being two-faced mm-hmm. and, and, and being short-sighted. And to me, you know, again, it's all about respect and trust and doing right by people. So the win-win mattered a lot. And it's something that, you know, so example would be, for instance, even at, at work, like employees and salaries. You know, even if somebody was willing to accept a salary, let's say lower than what our pay bands were, et cetera, because they were making less, we knew if they were worth something in terms of the value they're delivering and what others are getting, it's, it's a no brainer, right? They got paid what they were supposed to get paid. And we, you know, even if they insisted, hey, we're already getting a 10% raise or whatever that might right, be. Right, right. So I can give you countless examples of how we applied win win in practice at work. How did you, when you started the organization, how did you get your first customer? So, you know, the, in the beginning, like I said, we didn't have any contracts or I mm-hmm. didn't go in with some, you know, I honestly, I was a junior person of booze when I left. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I did is I did have like this reputation, at least of people I had worked with that always, I will always do my best. And mm, so first thing I did is I said, look, you know, I knew we wanted to go after government work, Mm -hmm. but all my previous experience, a lot of it was commercial with working fortune companies. So what I did is I called up some of the people that I'd worked with and I said, Hey, um, you know, I'm out here. I have another colleague of mine. Uh, you know, if you need like 1099 type consultants, et cetera. So, um, so just to pay the bills, get a little bit. And these were all commercial. So the very first client we actually got was a $25,000 gig. Actually, before that, it was a three thousand dollar piece of work. We probably did fifty thousand dollars of work to mm-hmm. define some requirements for a construction management firm. Okay. So we got three thousand dollars. I still have that check. Um, <laughs> if I had remembered, I would have brought it. But uh, then the second thing we got was a twenty five thousand um, dollar market research assessment of some IT systems for Alcoa. Um, and then the, I think the third or fourth clients were United Technologies. Um, Boeing, wow. um, so all fortune clients and, but that, you know, helped us pay the bills. It was kind of us flying out everywhere. I did a merger of two companies in Europe 
on behalf of United Technologies. I flew out to, and not a bad gig to uh, Frankfurt and Paris multiple wow. times. <laughs> but how do you even know how to do this kind of stuff, man? I like, it blows me away that you say that. I, I, I get presented with so many opportunities from the week. I'm like, I don't even know how to accept all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's, that, that have been my background, right? I had an MBA, I, I uh, had a business degree, I'd mostly done consulting on organizational and performance type work. Okay. So that was my background. So it wasn't that difficult for me to take that stuff on. So I definitely agree with you. If it was stuff like completely outside, I wouldn't have taken it. Right. Okay. So, but the people okay. I was talking to, I knew they were doing that type of work. Right. right. And so one thing I'll say is the government part, right. I knew that the government life cycle takes a while. Right. Yes. So I knew the pain point we wanted to address that I uh, like the specific area. Uh, was around uh, sourcing, uh, strategic sourcing or procurement, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And 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 so I started like I I started writing some papers on what the problem was and what needed to change. Okay. So I'm always about like really challenging. I always tell people from an entrepreneurial standpoint, if you're thinking about bringing going to talk to any customer, right, or creating something new, you first need to think about what are the pain points and what the need is. Okay. Uh, don't think about the solution because, you know, that's where we start a lot of times. Okay. Think about the pain points. What are you trying to solve for? So I knew a lot about procurement, having worked with some of these fortune companies, but also then having seen government. Okay. So I wrote out a few thought papers on what I believe are the insights I had on what the issues are and then okay. what can be done. So the Department of Defense, the Office of Secretary of Defense was doing a DOD-wide strategic sourcing program. Okay. Right. Pretty big thing. Every major firm, including my previous team of Booz, AT Carney, you can mm -hmm. imagine they had all gone and talked to them because this was defense wide strategic sourcing right. mm -hmm. out of the office of secretary of defense. So I found the person who was kind of starting to work on that over there because I was going to conferences and stuff and right. talking about some of this right. stuff. Right. Anyways, it took me, to, it took us a year. We had no preference we had no minority certification, nothing. Right. We had no government experience. So anybody who ever tells me that you need all of those things to work with government, I say bullshit. Okay. And, and, and because we were able to beat out just on sheer convincing of the client that we knew our stuff better than, I don't care which firm you put at the table, right? Whether it's McKinsey, BCG, I don't care. Right. And that's what I said. We will know our stuff better than anybody we convinced them to make it at least a small business. Mm -hmm. and, and, but we still competed against the big players because right. they all had like, right, this is my previous team, et cetera. Yes. And we ended up winning, uh, winning. And this small firm that had never won a government contract running the DOD wide strategic sourcing program. Oh my goodness. That's incredible, <laughs> man. That was That's our incredible. first government, that was our first government contract. That's incredible. Oh. Uh, I was really proud of that. I, you know, I worked on that a lot. And, I, you uh, know, I think I actually read um, a case study that they wrote about it here, where okay. you talked about improving uh, contracting portfolio visibility, eliminating redundant contracting actions amongst sub offices. Is that the one? Might be, yeah. So we did a bunch of that work then because we know we became known for it then. So um, the business line that Sensio, you know. Again, I think like one of the things, Eric, I'd say to a lot of people that listen and talk about, you know, whether they want to transition out of some larger firms or they're building their businesses. What I, you know, when I coach a lot of firms and uh, people, I, 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 one of the things, you know, I, I talk about is you really need to pick your focus areas and become known for what you do. I see too many players, just to be very candid in the government space, that you ask them, what do you do? They rely on their minority certification or mm -hmm. some certification and they say, yes. well, I can do everything. What do you do? How are you different? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and mm -hmm. honestly, it bothers me when people say that and I'll say me. why it's because it goes back to that results driven value. Right. Right. Because if you are not really, really strong at what you do, why do you deserve the business? Why do you want the money? That's mm -hmm. what I ask. Right. And it bothers me when people don't have an answer for that. And then then you're relying on some certification. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Right. That's what I say, because I think it's it's hard earned money. There's a lot of people that deserve it. 
right? Why should you get it? So I, I, I that's that's my guidance to people. I know it might sound harsh to people, no. but I, 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 I'm all for value. And like, if you are the best at, I, you know, you should get it. My, my audience knows, I, I preach that all the time. I tell people, um, you know, you go in there and you lead with value and then you say, by the way, I happen to be whatever status yeah, that you have, exactly. right? It's like, I'm a great company first. And then I just happen to be a small business. And I, I do want to tell, you know, just, just, I do want to say that we ended up getting an AA. Oh, right? did. But that was after like after this award, all, all of stuff. these things, right? So it wasn't something we needed, right? right. But it, we did rely on it. Uh, I will say how we relied on it. We never went after and set aside. We never right. did right. because none of it matched our work, right. Right? right? And so a lot of times, the what, but how it did help is if clients liked us, they could use Govern Direct to us then, sure. right? And that's how we got most of our work. They just came direct to us then. So. No, that's, that, I like that. That's, that's a strategic way of using the 8A as opposed to people looking for only set aside projects. And those companies, from, from my experiences, and you probably have better knowledge of that, they end up after the 8A program not being successful. Oh, yeah. Right. And you look at Sensia now, it's still a successful kind of because because there was always that core DNA. Right. Right. right? And that that's lived on. And uh, there's a bunch of contracts that are uh, competitive, all of that, you know. So, so now let's move on from Essentia. So then you have this crazy idea. You want to go start something new. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I'm a, I'm a, I, I told people, I think I'm a creator at heart. Okay. And I, so like I created Essentia, I built different practices. For instance, we started a higher education practice, built it really quickly. We were working with boards of higher, you know, universities at like some of the biggest kind of universities have like putting cost cutting programs, other things. So we did a number of, so applied kind of the entrepreneurial skill to create new things. But then, you know, I, I was looking at the whole public procurement space after having kind of, I took affinity to that. And I saw that, you know, I had, I had written a lot about the issues at a broader level beyond just say federal government. Now let me uh, stop you real quick. Yeah. You say you, yeah, you yeah. wrote a paper, like where did you submit these papers to? Cause you've said that a couple of times that you wrote papers, uh, outlining the problems, but where do they go? <laughs> no, they so I, you know, I'm very, I'm very like, I, I, I think of myself as a very practical person who likes to get hands dirty and do things. But at the same time, I like to really diagnose problems as a consultant. So I actually, um, I actually was a fellow while I was running Sensio. I ended up being a fellow at the Center for American Progress on the economic policy team. Um, so that was, uh, there was a lot of President Obama's people there at that time. So I was on the economic policy team and I, I wrote about, for instance, I looked at procurement at a broader level and, and I got a chance to also talk to a lot of people when I did some, you know, thinking and, and writing for uh, another gig like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I traveled to Europe. I went to Eastern Europe. I went other places and I talked to people about what's happening in public procurement. So what I, what I, what I came to the conclusion was there's $10 trillion dollars government spend all over the world mm -hmm. right and they're all talking about the same set of problems if you could be in tokyo you could be in london you could be in kiev you could be in washington you could be in seattle it's the same conversation right what's that so conversation said, what's the conversation it's it's basically you know how government procurement is so like so complex mm -hmm. how there are so many barriers for small companies i'm mm -hmm. like who am I, where am i like what city am i it's right. like sounds like the same thing it sounds like right? the same thing and yeah dc so so that led me to say you know what people are spending 10 trillion dollars that's more than one tenth of the world economy what if we could transform the way 10 trillion dollars are spent and how could we like try to solve this problem at scale so that's led me to about four years ago start public spend forum with that thinking and thesis in mind, that could we change the way governments across the world spend ten trillion dollars, and and that was kind of my motivation. I said, you know, I want to do something. I've solved problems as a consultant one by one. I want to see now can we build something at a much bigger scale, right? That can solve trillions of dollars in spending. So, so, uh, how, so how did you start? Like, what are you? I mean, again, I'm looking at it and saying. And, and I love your ideas because the way that you're describing it is um, Elon Musk is <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and it's true because, know that, but because it's true. you know, because Elon Musk is like, when you listen to people talk about, it, he says his whole 
decision making goes through a prism of how fast can we get people like to Mars, right? And yep. and so that's how he makes a decision. I've, as you can imagine, I've already I've talked to several companies who do forecasting and, and, and bidding and you know those types of websites, but they're only looking at very specific markets: a state market, a city market, a local market, and you're looking at the whole. I don't even know how to describe it. The entire world market, right? You're saying yeah. $10 trillion. But it is a very specific problem, right? Okay. Like, so, so I, again, you know, I, I diagnosed the problem a lot after we started. I didn't really know how to solve it, to be very honest. Again, this is just like when I jumped into Sensio. It was kind of like, hey, I don't have a business plan. I kind of know a problem. I think we'll figure it out. Right. I kind of took that. So I, and I do think from an innovation and problem solving standpoint, it's important that you don't jump in with preconceived solutions because mm -hmm. those, I think what happens, those are where the solutions fail. If you have this, cause the world is much more complex than some solution you have one on a piece of paper. Right. Right? right. And so when you start implementing that solution, it doesn't work. Right. right? And then guess what? You're stuck. If that was the only thing, so I kind of think about it as you need to really first understand the problem and have a sense of where do you want to take it, right? Where, where's, what's the end kind of North Star? And then there's going to be all sorts of potholes and, you know, detours That's along the way. And, and so I started with that thinking. I had some ideas, but I said, let's start testing them. And first couple of years, honestly, it was writing more, doing more research. I engaged a global, I started engaging a community in Europe. And here, uh, right. and when we started out Public Spend Forum, it was more like a think tank. It was we got funded a couple of research papers, like on metrics and stuff around procurement. And uh, by the Volcker Alliance, for instance, uh, you know, I, I, I happened to get to know Mr. Volcker, who did the Volcker Rule, um, and uh, and and you know, they funded some work. Uh, anyways, we did these papers, etc. But then that led us to as we engaged this community on a global level. A lot of people kept asking about market intelligence and how we don't have visibility into markets, right? And what's happening in markets. So that's what led to the main product of public spend forum now, two years later, mind you, right? So we again figured out, I didn't know exactly how do you solve $10 trillion. I'll be the first one to say, right. I had no clue, right? right? I, I, I still don't have a clue, but I think we're on the right path now. We tested the ideas. We got a lot of feedback from people. That led us to what we're building now is GovShop. Mm -hmm. And, and GovShop is a, you know, a supplier intelligence platform. And the goal there is to, if we democratize the way people access market information mm -hmm. and you give it to every single person, not leaders, don't look for policies. You hand it to the people that do decisions every day, make transactions happen every day. Right. What if we just kind of unleash this data on in the hands of everybody and get all the bureaucrats out of the way, get all the leaders out of the way, get all the policymakers out of the way, mm -hmm. give it to people that actually make a difference and do things on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Can we empower them, right? And make them the heroes that they we know they can be. And that's like, to me is the, what's like, what gets me, honestly, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. You know, if you give people the tools they need, and, and I think what we're trying to do is give people the data they need for on markets, and then they can better from a procurement standpoint, if I'm a government contracting person mm -hmm. or a program, I can take that information and I can make better decisions with it. And I know there are so many dedicated public servants, all these people that say public servants, public service, lazy, et cetera, bullshit. You know, I, I only people I know in public sector are freaking work hard as hell. They take calls on the weekends, right? And I know if you give people this information, they will do wonders with it. Right. And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do now, so. Wow, wow. I was reading, um, as we you know, getting ready for this interview, uh, there was a story on Public Spend Forum, it talked about Clearview Medical. Do you know oh, the yeah. story? Yeah. Can you yeah. share that story? So um, I, I mean, um, I just think it would be a great way to, to showcase the power yeah, of so, so there, and, and what it's done for people. Flip, flip side of the problem, right? So there's government people trying to get an understanding of what's happening in markets. Small businesses and companies face the same problem. There's all these amazing companies out there. And guess what? The number one thing I've heard over time is, I think we can probably both relate, right? Is like, who do you target? Who do you go after? Right. Where are the opportunities? Sure. Like there's also a market transparency issue, the flip side, 
Mm -hmm. than supplier space, right? So here's Clearview, a small company that pivoted during COVID, right? They were uh, doing, uh, I forget exactly what manufacturing, they pivoted to manufacturing face shields, so not too far from what they're doing, right? right? And they came on GovShop, and we, you know, they quickly found some opportunities, and government customers found opportunities. They had just pivoted into the space, but manufactured a face shield that was certified and got um, passed all the quality approvals, et cetera. They were supplying some customers in New York already, mm -hmm. and we brought them on the platform. And this is exactly what we want to do. Some government agencies that would have never found this small new company, they saw that. They did their own qualification of their product. I actually talked to one of the, the one of the persons that works for the chief procurement officer in New York City. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, there's a local supplier right next to you guys. I think they do really good work. Their product is certified. You should talk to them, right? So they got in touch and, and boom, we made a connection and they got millions of dollars in business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, it's, it's, it's not about the money as much as they came up with a solution. Somebody really mm -hmm. needed that solution, Absolutely. made that connection. But that's a great example of, you know, what we're trying to do at a massive scale, make thousands and hundreds of thousands of these connections happen. Oh wow! No, that that's 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 remarkable. Uh, I have here what it says. It says Public Explain Forum is a global market and supplier intelligence platform for public sector markets. Through GovShop, its free supplier and contract intelligence platform, PSF provides local, state, federal, and international government agencies comprehensive supplier and contract data across all markets. What does all that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah so, <laughs> I mean it sounds great, right? But. What does it mean it, to me? Yeah, very simply stated, right? Like data is a big problem. So if you're, a, uh, again, a government person who's a program official or mm -hmm. a contracting person, n trying to keep up with who are all the suppliers coming in and out of a market, right? Let's say take drones. Yes. Who are all the new startups? Who are new emerging companies, right? Understanding their track record, right? That's all very hard to do when you're trying to do all this paper pushing too, like, like write mm -hmm. all these contracts, et cetera, right? Understanding, I don't think even if you had the time, it's humanly possible for anybody to keep up with all of that, no, right? I would agree. And so, so like markets are complex. You know, Mark, the world is changing way, like much faster than the speed at which we think, right? And at which we can absorb information. Mm -hmm. So we need solutions where, you know, we can like, our goal is to do some of that work for people because it's humanly not possible. And then give something to them, then they can use it to make better decisions. So now let's say take that drones example. If I'm looking for a certain type of solution, I am not wasting my time trying to patch together a hundred sites and Google and all of that. And I still come up with an incomplete answer because I just don't have the time to do it. I get ready made. I can quickly go in, see lists of companies. I can filter them down. I can say which ones have already worked with government, which companies have they worked with, what are the specific capabilities and solutions they're bringing to the table. And then I can start to work with my, say, if I'm in the national security environment, and depending on how I'm using drones, let's say it's for uh, reconnaissance, right? Now I can start to more focus on that, like who are the right partners as opposed to piecemealing a thousand sites together. So that's what you know we're trying to do from, from a government standpoint. A couple of things. Along your journey, along your way, are there some mindful practices that you do, you know, in terms of exercise, uh, sleeping well, there's some, some books that you would recommend. Like, I mean, you know, mindfulness to me is a really big thing in all of it. It is. Because That's great. Like you said, there's ups That's and great. downs and, and business. And, and again, you have your family, you've got two kids. What are some of your mindful practices? So, you know, Eric, I'm glad you asked that because I love talking about this. So in a very quick sense, I'll say I think that's been like the most important thing I do because, you know, again, like I am a spiritual person mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, so I remind like to me, like I have a very, I learned this from a lot of different people I read about or, you know, they coached me, mentored me about like a morning routine. And I think that's really, really important. Okay. Having like a consistent morning routine, for instance, I've meditated like 30 days in a row. Right. Wow. Without missing a single day, no matter how busy I am, I get up around between 430 and five. Right. I usually drink a glass of water. That's the number one thing you do. You read anything, drink a full glass of water, 16 ounces. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do um, yoga usually. 
okay. uh, that, that centers you. And then I do meditation after that. But the key, um, you know, and I think all of those things, taking time for yourself, like do not look at email right as soon as you get up. Don't jump oh. on your computer. Right. So I think it's really important because life is complicated, right? Running a business is complicated. Absolutely. There's so many stresses. So I think you need to take that 15 to 30 minutes is what I tell people for yourself. Because if you use that time for yourself, believe me, the rest of your day is so much more powerful, mm. right? And, and a couple of things, you know, I try to remind myself, like spiritually every morning is, you know, yes, all the stuff I do is so exciting and I'm very passionate about it. However, at the end of the day, to avoid that stress and that anxiety that comes with running a business and mm. building things and everything, is I remind myself every day, that you know what, if everything disappeared, I have my health, I have my family, mm. and nothing else matters, <laughs> right? Very true. All the rest of the stuff we Very create true. is noise, it's and true. it's noise around us, right? Cars and houses and all these things, it's all noise we create to keep us going, right? And so mm. that keeps me honestly centered and always making good decisions that are values-based and always doing the right thing. I feel like that's really important to me as a person and you know what my parents my grandparents others have taught me and to me that's the most important thing i do all day honestly that's really powerful can you um say some parting words and then we'll let you go well um and thanks again for having me on eric but uh you know uh i really appreciate this kind of conversation because um you know i love to i think i think building businesses and do, and and working in in the government space is hard work but at the same time it's so rewarding mm -hmm. we need more people that are passionate about public service passionate about public sector coming in and really challenging the status quo giving it their all because mm -hmm. i think our reward is so good like i think we're helping everyone we're you know at the end of the day what we do can help us build a better country, a better right. world. Yeah. So no, I agree. Raj, thank you so much for coming on today, man. Good talk. I love it. Definitely hey, different thanks, than man. what we did, you know, the previous time, right? Okay. We're just getting to know each other. You know, this no, is this I'm is... happy to jump on just to more chat in general. Uh, yeah. and and uh, you know, anytime. Okay. And no. I love the work you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's it's I, when people say it's a labor of love, man. Like I told you, I I enjoy it. Uh, no, no, uh, you get to meet all these cool people, right? They, Not that's me. what I tell Not people. Me, I say I that people don't understand. <laughs> I go, Look, I get to meet all of these super cool people out here that like everyone wants to reach. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So so when you get to, so I'll give you a real story. Uh, one of my guests is now running for mayor. Uh, oh, nice. in Baltimore. So it's like, what happens if he becomes mayor, right? And then, uh, yeah, yeah, that's like, awesome. You get me? You can so, then post that podcast and call him up again. Oh, so, I mean, I could call him up anyways, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have not met a guest that's not happy to really meet me in person. That's awesome. Like, well, you know, hopefully we'll get to meet uh, at some point. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rod. Talk to you soon. Be good. Bye.